War has always been a game of attack and defense. The battering ram and the fortress, the catapult and the castle, the cannon and the fort. In our time, the fort has given way to the bunker, hidden under a concrete shell and a layer of ground. And perhaps soon, bunkers will also become useless. Today we have bombs for which meters of sand, stone and concrete are simply the distance to the target. Bunker busters are on the horizon. Despite the fact that bunker busting weapons are often presented as some kind of new solution, they appeared immediately after the appearance of bunkers, to put it mildly, not yesterday. Various methods of breaking through very thick walls, even hidden by the ground, were tested during World War I, and then the heaviest guns were responsible for this work, firing the most powerful shells. But it quickly became clear that a large shell or bomb was not enough, and they started playing with designs, and by the beginning of World War II, a new concept has formed. For a bomb to be able to penetrate the thickness of the ground and concrete, it must have high kinetic energy, speed and weight, have a minimum cross-section to minimize resistance, and be strong enough not to collapse during the penetration. Plus, it should explode not immediately, but with a delay, exactly where it is needed. The most famous implementations of this concept were the British Tallboy and Grand Slam. These were heavy aerial bombs. The former weighed 5.4 tons and the latter as much as 10 tons, with more than half of this mass being in a thick steel body. Dropped from bombers from a height of about 6,700 meters, they accelerated to supersonic speeds and penetrated several dozen meters of soil or several meters of concrete. They were not precision weapons, but as practice has shown, the bombs hit very close to the target and then exploding caused not only a shockwave, but also an earthquake that destroyed everything around. Therefore, they are often called earthquake bombs. Another interesting solution was the Disney bomb. It weighed just two tons, but took the concept further. Its casing made of hardened steel was even narrower, and its acceleration during the fall was boosted by a rocket engine. It plunged into the ground at a speed of almost 1600 kilometers per hour and could penetrate a concrete roof almost 5 meters thick, which made it a real scourge of German underground bases. In the USA, such bombs were also created. The 5.5 ton Tarzan, an analog of the Tallboy, the 10 ton T 14, by and large an analog of the Grand Slam and its successor, the T-12 Cloudmaker, a monster with a full weight of 19.8 tons. Of all this brotherhood, only the Tarzan managed to work during the Korean War. The T-14 did not find application, as well as the Cloudmaker. Of the entire US aviation, this monster could only be lifted into the air by the huge B-36 bomber. By that time, the military's interest in such bombs had waned. They were not needed against weak opponents, they did not have serious bunkers, and in the decisive battle of the poles of the Cold War, the main argument had to be nuclear weapons. Even the projects of earthquake and bunker busting bombs at that time most often assumed a nuclear charge inside. It's a good thing that they didn't have to be tested in real conditions. The neglect of bunker busters during the Cold War led to a rather difficult situation before Operation Desert Storm against Iraq in 1991. Bunker building technology had advanced over the decades, and now not only great powers could afford them. Iraq in the early 1990s was a serious force with an advanced military infrastructure, much of which was hidden in a whole network of fortified bunkers. The US and its allies found themselves at a stalemate. Nuclear weapons could not be used, the existing bombs were ineffective against deeply buried underground facilities, and they simply didn't have full-fledged bunker busters. The need for such a weapon was remembered at the last moment, and the engineers were faced with the task of creating it immediately. And they showed all their creative abilities. They did not create the bomb components from scratch, but used what was already there. The explosives, fuses, controls and laser guidance from existing aerial bombs and made the super strong steel casings from the barrels of decommissioned 203mm M110 self-propelled howitzers. 
Designed for the heavy loads from active fire, the large caliber guns were strong enough to penetrate concrete walls. The project was quite successful. The laser-guided aerial bunker buster bomb, called the GBU-28, was created in just a few weeks and quite cheaply. And it was effective. Weighing 1800 kilograms, it could be dropped from a variety of aircraft, carried about 306 kilograms of explosives, and in theory could penetrate any Iraqi bunker. The theory was put into practice almost immediately. During Desert Storm, the US Air Force attacked an underground Iraqi headquarters near Baghdad several times, but conventional bombs were ineffective. Then, a pair of F-111 bombers equipped with the GBU-28s were sent to the target. They dropped two bombs. The first missed due to a targeting error, but the second hit the target. The fortified underground base, which was one of Iraq's key command centers, was destroyed by just one bomb. By the way, this was the only use of the GBU-28 in Iraq. As it turned out, most of the targets were not as radically fortified as the key objects, and they were destroyed by the existing bombs. Nevertheless, the GBU-28 entered service with the US Air Force, were used in most wars of the 1990s and 2000s, and were also supplied to Israel and South Korea. In our time, the Cold War idea that all issues would be resolved by nuclear bombs has gone, while the experience of using new bunker-busting bombs has shown their effectiveness. Thus, many countries have taken up this topic, creating their own systems of this type. The Russian KAB-1500 of several versions, the Turkish SARP-83 and NAB-84, bunker-busting versions of the European Taurus and Storm Shadow missiles, and a whole string of new American bombs, of various versions and degrees of penetration into soil and concrete. Some of the inspirers of the further development of anti-bunker weapons are Iran and North Korea, which, knowing about the superiority of the air forces of potential opponents, are very actively developing their bunkers, placing entire bases, headquarters and factories underground, at depths of tens of meters under the soil and rocks. Conventional modern bombs are not enough to destroy such powerful targets, and the opponents have gone further. Thus, the successor to the Grand Slam was created in the USA, the GBU-57 MOP, or Massive Ordnance Penetrator. This monster weighs 14 tons and carries almost 2.5 tons of explosives. And here you can clearly see the difference between the MOP and the MOAB, the famous mother of all bombs, about which there is also a video on the channel. Despite the fact that many consider them similar, they are fundamentally different. With a mass of less than 10 tons, the MOAB carries 8.5 tons of explosives, many times more than the MOP, and can be dropped from low altitude from a transport aircraft, such as the C-130. It is capable of creating a huge explosion with a powerful shockwave, but it is not penetrating, works on the surface, and against underground objects it is practically useless. The MOP, dropped from a height of over 10 kilometers, is capable of penetrating 60 meters of soil, the height of a 20-story building, and reaching almost any modern underground facility that could previously only be destroyed by a direct nuclear strike. The bomb was tested on the B-52, but at the moment it is intended to be used only by the B-2 Spirit Bomber, with potential adaptation for the new B-21 Raider. If you think this is a radical step, look at what South Korea is doing. Knowing that their northern neighbors have military installations at depths of almost 100 meters, they are creating bunker-busting warheads for ballistic missiles. I talked about the importance of kinetic energy and speed. Imagine what it's capable of if it's not a bomb dropped from an airplane, but a warhead that arrives with a ballistic missile. A kind of modern interpretation of the idea of the old Disney bomb. Moreover, they have a missile project which involves the use of a warhead similar in performance to the GBU-57. Scary to imagine what it will be like. Although it is still necessary to find out whether the bomb casing, even steel, is capable of withstanding an impact at almost hypersonic speed of several thousand kilometers per hour. And there is no doubt, they are not the only ones making such things. The race between armor and projectile, bunker and bomb, continues. 
Let's hope that it won't be necessary to test the effectiveness of all this in practice. Write in the comments what you think about this weapon and its potential. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel, there's still a lot of interesting things on the horizon.